So, Barbara, you're about, what, uh, end of second week? You're about to go into tech? We are end of third week. We are almost at the end of the third week. Yeah, we're going into tech on, technically, technically, on Monday. Uh, we, on this weekend, we introduced the band okay. into our process. So we have our suits pro, suits pro that. So you're about to actually have all your elements come together, which is, yeah. from, as a director myself, that's one of my favorite times. I know yeah. some people aren't crazy about Tech Week. I love Tech I Week. I love it too, because it's, um, I feel like it's where everybody's imagination gets to be seen all together. Mm -hmm. And th I feel like the process gets a little less lonely. Yeah, <laughs> you know, no, absolutely. Like, so you're sort of welcoming the whole family together, and, and I find it exciting too. I really like it as well. So what drew you specifically to, to want to direct Sweet Charity? A good question. It's, 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 not, it's not produced a lot. <laughs> no, it's not. And I, I'm now that I'm into it even more, I'm surprised. I mean, I think it's just been one of those pieces that people kind of look at the subject matter and go, oh, I don't know, in this day and age, can we tell a story about Tangled or about uh, dance hostesses, mm -hmm. right? Dance hall hostesses. But I think for me, I was reading an article by Stacey Wolf. She's a an academic who studied musical theater and I came across that when I was doing my my masters and she was just talking about the relevance of musical theater in today's society and is it still relevant and that's sort of her general study and she talked about sweet charity and she talked about the rise of sort of the feminist musical in the 60s so and by today's standards we probably wouldn't consider them feminist musicals but they were sort of the beginning of that a genre where there was a female lead mm -hmm. that was driving the story, so Hello Dolly, uh, Sweet Charity, um, I'm not going to be able to think of all the other ones right now, but those are the two that pop into my head. Yeah, and I guess the big thing about Sweet Charity in terms of how it might be viewed today is, you know, do you see it more as a, is it more about misogyny or more about sexual freedom? I think it's more about sexual freedom, and, and also just freedom in general for women, so the, un the underlying story is sexual freedom, but I think it really is about this woman who's trying to find her way in a new time in the 60s, mm -hmm. which was about sexual freedom, but also about women being allowed to pursue a career sort of more wholeheartedly, you know? And it's the time of like, um, I mean, it's the time of the femi feminist movement and um, Sex and the Single Girl by Helen Gurley Brown and the feminine mystique, like all that stuff was coming out. And it wasn't just addressing sex, but it was also addressing you know, how do you live as a woman who's not just pursuing marriage mm -hmm. as your end as your end game, mm -hmm. right? And so to me, this story was really interesting because Charity is pursuing sort of the traditional life because that's what the era she would have been brought up in was the 50s, right? So she's living in that world, but mm -hmm. there's something about her as a human being that those two things don't fit together and she hasn't quite figured that out yet. And it's not to say that marriage isn't right for her, she will never have that dream, but she's pursuing it sort of in the traditional sense. And along the way, she's trying to figure out who she is. And so I think that was, that's the long story of why I was drawn to it. You know, the question of where am I going, that whole song in the middle where she sings, where am I going and why do I care? You know, and how do I figure out who I am? Like to me, that was such a, um, it was just, a, I found that very moving. And in this article, she just talks about that. Like, it's one of the only musicals where women kind of have jobs. Right. <laughs> I mean, they're not a job you would maybe aspire, aspire to. to, but it is a real part of life now too, right? And and these women are supporting themselves because they had to, they all had dreams, and who, and this is where they ended up. And so it explores their job, it explores their relationships within that job. You know, and I found that really fascinating and I thought it was, I thought it was important to have that conversation with this age group of women too. I was interested in that. Well, I wanted to ask you about that so that you have predominantly a female cast. Yeah, and that's the other reason. I thought this show could be, would be amazing for predominantly females. But they're also, you know, it's dealing with our parents' generation, yeah. their grandparents', our grandparents yes. generation. And so did you find that you had to, what kind of work have you done with the, with the cast? to sort of maybe go beyond what they might see as the stereotypic view of the 60s mm -hmm. because it's it's, yeah. it's very removed from their experience. It is, yeah. I mean, we've done, I've talked to them a lot about what was happening in that time frame and how it relates to them now and whether they struggle with the same challenges. And I would say across the board, that, you know, there's a lot of like, yes, I understand this. 
you know, and I think it's been really interesting for them to see that their grandparents were perhaps going through the same struggles, especially as young women, and in some ways it was even harder. And I think that's the other part, is they realize how privileged their journey is in some ways as a mm-hmm. woman. Right. You know, there's still a, a battle for women to be treated equally in the workplace, and, and there's lots of, you know, that. so it's easier for them, but at the same time they talk about, you know, what is expected of them and how they still feel some of those pressures. Mm-hmm. You know, to get married, to live a traditional life, to not, am I allowed to talk about this, to not have too many sexual partners. Absolutely. You know? it's, it's, it's inherent in this, it's one of the big questions. It is, and it is what ultimately in the end happens in the end. And I think we worked on the last scene last night and I, I could feel, it was just the three of us, and I could feel how heavy it was for them. You know, especially for Lara, I would say, like, this idea that someone would choose not to marry you because you weren't a virgin, mm-hmm. or a poetical virgin, as Oscar likes to say. Right. And that that you be- have a past. You have a past, and that you're being um, mm-hmm. a left or broken up with because of who you are, ultimately. You know, and that is really the... the I said to a friend of mine this morning, that ha- that's happened to all of us, regardless of what the reason is. A breakup mm-hmm. is a breakup. So, But, yeah, I think women still talk about being too much or too loud or too too um, sexy or not sexy enough, right? Right, or the word bossy is never or associated bossy. with a man. No, or aggressive, mm-hmm. right? Like, oh, she's so aggressive. And it's like, well, that would be considered um, a, a, a quality in a man that you would want. Mm-hmm. Not aggra- it wouldn't be interpreted as aggressive, it would be interpreted as ballsy, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I think it's it's relevant and I'm, I was surprised at how relevant it was. Now, have you, have you stayed really rooted in the 60s in terms of design and you know, or is there ways you've tried to draw those kind of contemporary parallels? I think we're staying pretty rooted in the 60s. There's a few scenes that really like address the yeah, costume-wise, everything's living in that world, like hair, makeup, all of that stuff. Men have hats, and like it's very traditional in that in the form. Um, there's a scene where we're it's the, it's '66, so we're slowly moving in. We're kind of in the middle, the beginning of the hippie movement too. Mm-hmm. So we have a scene where they end up going to it's a hippie hippie church basically. Right. So we're playing with that, and I think aesthetically, we're living there for sure. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I mean, we're talking about some of these big themes and yeah. big ideas that it deals with. Yeah. It's a really fun show. There's a lot of humor it's in it. Very... There's like some great music in it. Yeah. Um, it is very funny. I forget how funny. It is I forgot really... how funny it is. It's very dry. And there's humor in it that is, there's slapstick in it. There's like, you know, someone, they get stuck in an elevator at some point. Like there's all that kind of humor about the, about neuroses and about you know, it's very, I find it very funny. So how, do you find it challenging to, does the musical theater format make it difficult at times to maybe not romanticize or stereotype these characters? Like that's a little tricky line to walk at times? Yeah, I think so. And I think we have in some ways done that. Um, you know, we look at something like Big Spender or those, the, like the mus- those musical numbers and it is about women working, their sex workers, right? So Big Spender has, is this iconic number that sort of has a stylistic view to it, but it, it is ultimately about women trying to entice somebody to, to, to dance with them. Yeah. You know, so I think it, it can be challenging. I find the script, I really like the script, so I think it makes it easier. You know, I think they've found a way of navigating the genre that is interesting and intelligent. So it's, it hasn't been too challenging. I would say the hardest part has been teaching teaching comedy hmm. it's a bit of a different style of comedy than i think stu- like a lot of young people are used to now even myself i think it's not really what i grew up on it has a little bit of like the lap some of it has like the lap in quality or like that kind of right. era of humor yeah so it's a bit some more. of what we might have seen on the carol burnett show. on the carol burnett we talk <laughs> about carol burnett like often i'm like this is more carol burnett you know like these kinds of jokes so i think yeah. that part has been challenging yeah. Um, I one of the last things I want to ask you about, because it is unique to the college. What's it been like working with our studio ensemble where they're in the show, but they're also effectively a company who's, who's working yeah. on the production staff, working on the marketing side, pr- helping to produce the show, that they all have jobs yeah. outside, off stage as well? Off stage. I think it's, it's equally challenging as well as it's rewarding because they're tired <laughs> so that's cha- that's the challenging part 
you know, so when they're finished here, they have to go and do their other jobs or in the mornings they do production calls or, you know, we've been lucky so far they have actually had days off. So I think that's been great. But I think it's also been rewarding in that it, they invest in the process. Mm -hmm. So, and it's been great for me sometimes because I can be like, what is happening here set wise? Or like, can we have this? Like it can change in the room. You have your entire cast at, I a, do. at a production and meeting. Exactly. And costumes too. Like, you know, they know what they're playing. They're seeing the characters evolve on stage where often, you know, as you know, it's the design comes first. Right. Yeah. And so I actually am sort of like, oh, that's an interesting thing. I'm wondering how to incorporate that into other pro other processes where, yeah, like is the designer in the room and have the, watching us develop the character and how does that change? You know, so I think that is really rewarding. And I think it gives them an appreciation for all of those jobs when they go out into the world. And I, and I think that's super important as someone as, again, I'm sure you understand and know like you as an actor, sometimes it becomes very self-involved and you forget all the people that are there with you as part of the process, that they're actually part of the team. And the actor needs all of those people. You have nothing to say if no one writes it. That's correct. <laughs> you have nothing to wear. <laughs> you won't be seen if no one's lighting you and you won't be heard if the sound isn't excellent. And so I think that's an amazing gift to come away from an education with, mm -hmm. you know, especially in this intensive format. I also think it, it gives them the opportunity to see how strong they are. Yeah. You know, it gives them a sense of resilience and, and ownership over that because they're doing all of it as opposed to they're not spoiled by any means. <laughs> not that actors are spoiled. I didn't I don't mean that. No, no. no, no. <laughs> uh, what what I guess finally what would what do you hope is the sort of it's it's that awful question no, that okay. I've always been asked so I'm going to yeah. ask you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yay. <laughs> what do you hope the audience will take away from their experience? Oh wow. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think I, I do hope they take away the understanding that this journey is still happening. And I think we'll have audience members who lived this world too. So I think I would like to see that. I would like to see audience members take away because it's not a happy ending, you know? <laughs> Spoiler alert. And I think it, it's, it would be interesting for me to have audience members walk away and consider that this is still a relevant conversation today. I also want them to have a good time. I'm always looking for both. Right. You know, I want them to feel moved by it. You know, both to joy and to contemplative, you know, contemplating that possibility. Great. And I think they will. I think they will. I'm sure they will. Yeah. I look forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.